Tonight marks the 49th anniversary of a John Lee's passing. And in thinking about it tonight, what topic might be an appropriate topic to think about in, in connection with a John Lee? I remember one of a John Fuang's comments that John Lee once sent to him that when he was giving Dharma talks, there was very little of his stuff in the Dharma talks. It was mostly for the people there. But when he did talk about himself, about his reasons for practicing, one theme came out quite often. It's a huge sense of karmic debt. The exact opposite of our Western attitude towards the practice. We come here feeling entitlement. That the tradition owes us something. And in John Lee's feeling, it went the other way. On the one hand, he felt he had a karmic debt to the beings he'd had to eat ever since he was a child. His body came from their bodies. And there was a debt to all the people he may have harmed in previous lifetimes. He owed them something. But there was also a very positive debt toward the Buddha's teachings. Again, John Fuang noted, as he said, if it hadn't been for John Lee, he wouldn't have seen the brightness of the world. Because he himself was in a pretty bad position. He was orphaned at a very early age, didn't do well in school, didn't have many skills by which he could make a living, had no connections. And he said when he began to realize the Dharma that he'd been hearing ever since a child, it hadn't, up to that point it hadn't really sunk in, but he, when he started really hearing it, he looked at his life and he realized he was probably in debt to a lot of people. And the only way to pay off those debts was to practice, so that he would have something positive to offer, both himself and the people around him. And so it might be useful to reflect as you practice, what kind of debts do you have? And they're pretty much the same, that list that a John Lee would give. You've got this body. And even if you've been a vegetarian since birth, and there are very few of us who have been, still there's a big debt to all the farmers, all the suppliers, all the people who've brought us that food. When you're born with a human body, there's this huge gaping need. The body needs to be fed if it's going to stay alive. And then there are the people you've been feeding off emotionally. The people whom to, to whom you owe your you owe your knowledge, your knowledge of language. I mean, your parents taught you how to how to walk, how to talk, and then your teachers, all the various people you've benefit from, benefited from. And there's also a debt to those who have taught us what's right and what's wrong and how we can find happiness in the midst of all this interconnectedness. People talk about interconnectedness as if it were a good thing, but you look at it, it's a lot, largely feeding. In fact, that was the Buddha's main image for causality, when he wanted to teach causality to young novices, that all beings subsist on food. Without that food, we couldn't live. That's the basic pattern for causality. You take something from others in order to exist. And so our quest for happiness is not just a selfish personal quest. It's getting out of that interconnected pattern of having to eat. You find a happiness that doesn't have to feed, doesn't need to take anything away from anyone else at all. And that right there is a huge gift. I don't know how many people say that 
Buddhist teachings are selfish, that you're just in it for yourself, but not really. You're taking yourself out of a system. Or just to survive, you have to keep feeding and feeding and feeding. And then when you find that happiness, then you have a lot to offer. You look at a John Lee's life, he taught many, many, many people. Because once you found that kind of happiness, again, since your, your issues or over-happiness are done or taken care of, then you find you have a lot to offer other people. And your gift to them is pure. It's not based on what you want to get out of them or even the, the pleasure you might get out of being generous. You don't have to feed off that, because as we've all seen, people who feed off the need to feel good about themselves end up doing a lot of harm. Totally unintentional, but there's a lot of delusion in that, that kind of help, or help that's offered without delusion. Totally a free gift, like the Buddha's teachings. That kind of a huge impact for the good in the world. As monks, this is something we think about, should think about all the time. The food we get comes from the generosity of others. What gives us the energy to breathe, to move around, to think, to speak? And what are we doing with that energy? And the fact that we go for an alms round every morning, that drives home the point that we're here dependent on the generosity of others. And so we can't let that generosity go to waste. It's frittering our way our time with random defilements. We want to put that generosity to good use, because again, we're in debt. But the same principle holds for everyone, lay or ordained. Our mere survival depends on a huge network of help from other beings, other people not all of whom are offering that help voluntarily. But you take that help and you use it in the quest of purifying the mind from its defilements, finding a happiness that allows you to be happy without having to feed, physically or emotionally. That puts you in a position when you're offering help to others, you're offering it without delusion, without the secret need to feed off of that feeling, well, I'm good because I'm giving to others. That's really the best use you can use of the help that you've gotten from others. Because we're sitting here meditating, you may find the mind thinks up the thought, well, that's enough for tonight. We'll ask yourself, is it really enough? Are you really in a good position? To offer the results of your meditation to others, as we do when we dedicate the merit of our practice, which we should be doing every day. Is it good enough to dedicate? Is it something you're proud to dedicate? someone received a package of your state of mind and they opened it up, what would they find? A dirty toy rabbit? Or they find something clear, clean, inspiring? So as you meditate, think of the meditation as a gift to yourself and to the people around you. It's the repayment of a loan, but you're doing it as a gift free and clear. And so you want the quality of the gift to be something that you're proud to hand over.
And John Lee found that thought a good, strong motivation for the practice. And you look at what he left behind. All the books, all the Dharma talks, and the example of his life. Back in the 19th century, the Victorians had a, had a custom of writing the, the lives of inspiring people. And we seem to have lost that here in the West. Most biographies like to take down the, the person they're writing about. And the result, of course, is it doesn't inspire people to make greater sacrifices and basically trying to pull everybody else down to our level, saying, well, they had their defilements, so it doesn't matter that we have ours. But there really was something inspiring in that old habit, looking at people and trying to see what was really good in their lives, what they had to offer other people, what good qualities they'd build into themselves. And it can be a real inspiration for make for us to make ourselves more mindful, more generous, more virtuous, to train ourselves in the skills that we need to find a true happiness that goes beyond the ordinary. And even if we can't teach the way John Lee did, at least the example of our behavior should be something inspiring to others as well. Because that right there is a very important teaching. So try to develop the qualities of mind, so that not only your meditation, but also all your actions, your words, your deeds are a gift. an inspiration to yourself and to the people around you.